And joining us today in our book talk segment, we're going to talk to a man who's uh, written a book that is uh, really kind of fascinating. It's called The Big Bad Book of Botany. We're joined today by uh, Michael Largo from uh, actually across the state from where we are in Sarasota over in the Miami area. And he joined us by telephone. And Michael, uh, good to talk to you today. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have a chance to, to chat with you for a few minutes. And uh, when, when you hear the term botany, I guess a lot of people kind of go back to their high school days when they when they were kind of forced to take a botany class. But uh, this book kind of makes it uh, kind of makes it interesting. Uh, the, the, breaks it down to uh, the good parts, the interesting parts of botany. Was, was that the point? <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. You know, the uh, you know, like you hear that word botany in high school, like you said, and that's like time to take a nap. So, um, <laughs> you know, what I try to do with this subject is is uh, Make a kind of book where it has not only the facts about so many kind of weird plants that are out there and strange and plants and plants that we know, but also the fol folklore behind them. You know, the history, where they come from. You know, where does a cup of coffee come from? Well, you know, my kids think vegetables come from aisle five in public, you know, so, uh, you know, trying to make it fun so that, you know, we, you know, people get to look at plants and see how important they are and how really amazing survival techniques they've come up with throughout the centuries. I guess when you look at it, uh, a third of our food is, is from plant life, right? Animal, dairy, and, and, and plant, right? Right. At least a third. Right, right. So it's an important yeah, thing. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and it really a lot of the pharmacology, you know, that we have now, all the pills and you know, everything that's there, most of it is trying to duplicate one of the ingredients that a plant had at one time, you know, because that was the real pharmacy store for most of humanity is the plant world. And now we're going back to that sort of in many ways to try to find the, the secret properties of plants that help people. You, you think it is a kind of an under, under, uh, I guess, uh, appreciated science, if that's the right word. Uh, like you said, drugs too. I didn't think of that, but a lot of drugs, uh, I guess the Native Indian, Native Americans, I mean, they all kind of investigated or came up with all those drugs from the plant world, right? Yeah, Originally. I mean, you know, take... Yeah, you take a plant like poison ivy, you know, the Native American, you know, the first settlers that came here said, you know, they obviously knew that was a rat, you know, you get a rash from it. But, um, you know, the American, uh, Native Americans uh, showed them that when you dry it out, it turns into one of the hardest lacquers you can find when you take the root out and dry it out. I mean, uh, there's some, uh, in ancient China, they used to have the great lacquered little tables and stuff they made from poison ivy. So even a plant you think is bad has some good parts to it. You know, and that and that and that's like the history of, of plants that I try to incorporate in the Big Bad Book of Botany. Yeah, what uh, what was kind of your process? I mean, it's, it's, it's such a large topic. How, how did you kind of break it down and and find out some of these maybe you know lesser known or some cases unknown uh, uh, secrets of, of these plants? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, this uh, plant kingdom, kingdom is giant. You know, so I tried to incorporate plants that would be of interest to people. Uh, you know, the kinds of plants. You know, coniferous plants, plants that stink. You know, plants that are poisonous. <laughs> Uh, you know, my other books help have a lot to do with like final exits and those kind of things. So I have a little macabre, uh, streak to me. So I have a lot of books that, you know, turn people, uh, plants that turn people into zombies, uh, <laughs> plants that, po you know, plants that poison kings. So I can't get away from that. But also like tequila, where did it come from? What, what plant makes vodka? Uh, how do you make, you know, the, what's the actual thing that makes that beer that you're going to go have, you know, later on tonight or whatever? So, so when you're sitting down, it's not only a thing to look at the plants that we have in front of us, but a lot of cool little facts they try to incorporate to make you make people look at plants in a in a new way. Yeah, why is that? You mentioned some plants really stink. Why is that? A lot of flowers, obviously, that, that's a good smell, but some are brutal. <laughs> have you figured that? Out? Yeah, why? I mean, here, yeah, I mean, <laughs> just, you know, the deal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The deal with that is that you know, all plants, the basic thing is to survive, and the plant, and the basic thing is is to you know have offspring, right? appropriate. So they got to come up with that. And think how disadvantaged a plant is. It's stuck in the ground. You can't have to fight back. So some plants, you know, would use, like, say, the skunk cabbage or this weird plant called the corpse flower, uses a, a very, very bad odor. I mean, really, the corpse flower smells like something dead. And the whole idea, it grows in a swamps or a bog. So there's no bees there or things to, that would normally pass it to pollinate it. So it... it, it had an evolutionary development where it's using flies and attracts flies thinking that, you know, they're going to dead meat and there's their pollinators. So that's the, you know, that would be the reason why that, well, another plant say like the oleander that we have all throughout Florida, beautiful plant. Uh, the flower is super sweet to bees and hummingbirds, but every single part of that flower, the stem and the root is poisonous to us. 
Mm. You know, and uh, if you don't know what that plant looks like, they plant it around schools, nursing homes here in Miami. I mean, it's just like, you know, don't let the kid tell the kids what it is, you know. <laughs> that, so that. <laughs> I thought it was interesting, uh, the chapter you did on the Venus flytrap, that's kind of always been the plant. I guess a lot of kids probably get that as a uh, you know present or sometime in their life because you can feed it bugs. Talk a little bit about that plant. That, that, that's kind of misunderstood too, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's the, um, you know, the again, it's the idea for it to um, where, it is, where it originally comes from North and South Carolina. Most people don't realize that it's native home uh, in the in the bogus areas over there. And again, it was sort of like the skunk cabbage where it was not too many pollinators coming by. And also the nutrients of the estuaries where it, where it grows uh, is not so regular, the pH of the soil. So this plant really developed over time to make its leaves into small traps. And it has a really incredible amount of, uh, it's, all, it's very similar to quote, like say nervous system that when something touches it, it takes, it traps that plant, and uh, but it even distinguishes between, you know, something that's not edible and something that is. Hmm. Um, that's again, and that, it's really the leaves. It's a, it's really the flower of the leaves of brackets they call them. So that that turns into over time, a, a, you know, an anatomy that works that traps this insect. So it's really what it's trying to do is get the nutrients from now this insect that it can't get from the soil. So that was its carnivorous um, adaptation, which is a really cool plant, you know, for kids like that plant, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, you go back to some of the science fiction show. I think I think Lost in Space had uh, large uh, man right. plants. Remember well, that? <laughs> Dr. Smith. Dr. Dr. Smith. Smith. <laughs> I think we had a talking carrot on one of those shows, if I remember right. Remember that right. one? <laughs> he was the guy that always used the last drop of water. You right, know, right. The, uh... <laughs> Sunflower. I thought that was interesting. I, I had kind of a farm growing up. We grew up in Long Island. We have a backyard farm. We grew sunflowers uh, a lot. And I didn't know until, until I read your book, uh, they always produced the, the same amount of seeds. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's kind of, you know, that's one of the, that's again one of those weird, things that makes people say, wow, i got to look at plants a little differently. They always produce either 55 or 144, yeah. either one or the other, and which is, which is very, very strange. And so even Leonardo da Vinci used this plant as a way to make a math formula to devise ratios that he used in paintings. And it really wasn't, and he just did this, and no one understood what he was talking about, but he used the sunflower. And only until, like, the late 1970s that a scientist really proved this theory of the sunflowers, this math, that actually is incorporated into code of computer. So uh, the early code and the early binary codes of computers are coming from this ratio, this formula, from the sunflower plant. Yeah, which is interesting. You know, pretty strange, mm -hmm. you know. Do you think uh, you know, you've studied botany to, to write this book? Is there a lot more we don't know? Or how, how much do you think we do know at this point about what plants can uh, provide? Well, one of, that's really pretty much what I walked away with. You know, this, this project was a tremendous amount of research, uh, more than any of my other books. And what I walked away with was this incredible fascination that we're really only sc scratching the surface mm -hmm. of what the plants have to offer. Um, you know, the ancient peoples understood this, like you said, the Native Americans and throughout the cultures, uh, Hippocrates, you know, Greek doctors and all these guys, they knew certain plants were good. Like licorice, for example, we used to just think it was a candy, and now science is proving that there's an ingredient in it that also helps liver disease, you mm -hmm. know. So um, this... It's just, and that's just one example, and it goes on and on and on. That all these small, there's a very, very small plant, I guess, which is probably just, you know, been discovered. It's the smallest planted flower in the world called the Wolfia flower. And it's so small, you almost need a microscope to see the flower. And it looks just like green stuff flying on the water. But now science has found that, you know, it has this tremendous amount of protein, more than soybeans, more than meat. So they're, they're, this, and it's so easy to grow. It sort of, you know, just grows. Um, and now they're trying to develop systems where they can plant this, this in, in waterways throughout the world and pretty much feed the world with this tiny little flower that people just thought was some kind of algae or whatever. They couldn't even, they didn't even know what it was. So um, that's what's happening, you know, with the plant world. There's so much stuff that we can learn from it. Yeah, I think uh, the medicinal value of this 
cures for cancer or other diseases, that would be great if we could find exactly which plant it was, right? <laughs> and usually the most poisonous ones, uh, there's some, you know, poisonous plants, um, like the caliber bean, which is a, it's a really cool thing if you read, read the book. But they're, they're so poisonous, but they're taking some of that poison to use to uh, find to help. It's actually working in experiments to fight the most deadly disease AIDS. Yeah. So the poison for one way and a benefit another way, you know. So um, that's part of part of the exploration. I hope people get from reading, you know, the Big Bad Book of Botany to say, "Wow, okay, I, this is just. You know, I only have about three hundred plants, but if you out, look out your window, what is that plant? Where did it come from? If you know the name of the plant, it's like walking into a conference room and you don't know the name of the people. Uh, if there's a name tag, it helps you a little bit. But if you know the names of the plants that you walk in the woods in front of you or your house or wherever down the field or the park, you have a more familiarity and you have more enjoyment and you have a history about them. That makes it makes your time uh, in, in the park or the woods more enjoyable. Well, it is a fascinating book. Again, The Big Bad Book of Botany. We've been talking with uh, Michael Largo today, part of the uh, Big, Big Bad Book series. You've done a couple of these, right? The Beasts was a previous Yeah, one. well, I did The Big Bad Book of Beasts was about animals, but I don't really know of any more alliterations with bees, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, be, 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 I'm not, I think I'm running out of that. You got to do a baseball <laughs> book. Yeah, that's it, baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Yankees. <laughs> Yankees, right. You've got a website, Michael. People get a hold of the book. Uh, I have michaellargo.com. And uh, you can friend me on Facebook. I might just look up my name, and uh, I'll answer anybody's questions. I'd be happy to hear from everybody. So I appreciate that. Great. Michael, appreciate, appreciate taking a few minutes today. Good luck with the book. I know it's doing well uh, already. And uh, please let us know when the next one comes out. We'd love to have you back on again.